It is now my pleasure to turn the webcast over to Jennifer Jolly. Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lindsay. Welcome to today's webcast on managing conflict in family business, featuring Otis Baskin and Dana Telford of the Family Business Consulting Group. Today's discussion is part of the family business services offered by Zions Bank Corporation, a financial services company consisting of a collection of great banks that operate under unique brands across 11 and southwestern states. Our eight locally managed banks have dedicated relationship managers who can provide expertise to assist and support family businesses. So please let us know if you want more information about stock ownership record keeping, succession planning, exit strategies, or other topics. We have great people ready to help support your unique needs. Today's discussion focuses on one of the fundamental challenges faced by those in family-owned businesses, managing conflict. Dana and Otis will cover common conflict cycles that family businesses encounter and keys to effectively manage them. I am pleased to introduce our presenters from the Family Business Consulting Group. Dr. Otis Baskin was the founding director of the Family Business Forum at the University of Memphis and is a former dean of Pepperdine University. His expertise in it is in helping family owning fa business owning families develop plans for leadership succession, development of next generation leaders, and family ownership structures. Dana Telford specializes in succession planning, family governance, board effectiveness, and conflict management. He earned an MBA from Harvard Business School and is a third generation member of a commercial real estate firm. We'll begin today with Otis. Thank you, Jennifer. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome everyone today. And we'd like to begin by emphasizing the title of our presentation. Dana and I today will be, and I'll be talking to you about avoiding conflict in family business, but rather managing it. And the difference is this. Uh, a good friend of mine is a, who is a marriage counselor once said to me, when a couple comes to him and says, we never argue, his response is, someone isn't listening. And I think that's true in families. If there's never any conflict, then important things really aren't being talked about. So let's talk about how conflict can be managed productively, because in fact, conflict can be a productive element of family relationships and good business relationships. So let's start there by thinking about successful relationships. In a successful relationship, you know, we are often focused on happiness. That's our greatest source of really lasting happiness is, uh, is really success. The form, uh, you know, the foundation really of all superb organizations is, is really in the successful relationships too. We want superb business organizations that have the foundation of these good relationships. And, you know, these things help us to become stronger because we practice good communication. Good communication is what supports successful relationships. It's what makes us enjoy the relationships, and it's what makes them productive for us. Um, it does require some things from us, though, and one of the most important things required is forgiveness. Uh, we have to be prepared to forgive, not hold on to grudges. And particularly in family businesses, this addresses things that may go way back in family relationships. If we're going to have successful relationships in our family, we're going to have successful relationships in our businesses, we have to be prepared to move on from the past. And that is hard work. It's not something that is easily accomplished. We have to continue to work at successful relationships. It's important to keep in mind, too, that these good relationships can be and too often are easily destroyed. We have to work at them to make them continue to be effective. And everything that I've said here is based in trust. Trust is the key in all good family business relationships. Trust is really why we work together as family members, why we choose to go into business with each other. As you look at this slide, the world of trust and mistrust, 
it's important to realize that these concepts really work in tandem. On one side is mistrust and all the things that stem from it, and the other side, trust and the positive things that come out of it. In both of these are based on certain assumptions. We assume trust. We assume trust in family members, and that's why we go into business together, but trust cannot be based only on assumptions. It leads to certain expectations. And if our expectations aren't met, then we question trust, and that can lead to some very dysfunctional behaviors. One of those is the whole issue of win-lose prospect. When people are in business together, uh, if it begins to seem like one person is seeking to win at the expense of another, that creates an expectation that, that can dissolve trust. But when problem seeking and solving is the issue, when we identify problems and we say let's find ways that to solve these problems together, those create expectations that really build trust. And that takes us to role modeling behavior, which is so important in family business. You know, if the role modeling becomes competitive, attack, defend, withdraw, that's destructive of trust in the relationship. On the other hand, if we have a role modeling behavior of confronting issues as they come up, not sweeping them under the table and not saying, oh, we can't bring that up because if we do, it might destroy our relationship. If we are able to talk about these things, get them out there where we can deal with them, then we have ways of coping, and coupled with that need to be uh, expressions of and methods for caring, being able to demonstrate that we care for each other in spite of difficult decisions that we may have to make, difficult issues that we may have to deal with, Caring is an important part of our relationship that has to be there, even when we're confronting tough issues. And when we get to selective reinforcement, I think it's important for us to understand that we have choices to make here. Uh, and, and it comes down to this issue of reciprocity in the whole environment. Is that destructive or constructive reciprocity? Dana, you have some insight into that concept. Why don't you share that with us? Yeah, I do. Thanks, Otis. When I see this slide, it brings back memories to me of the first time I saw it presented by Lou Barnes, who was a professor at Harvard Business School, and he talked about the norm of reciprocity. And his point, and, and I've seen it work over and over and over again, is that we're humans and we reciprocate behavior uh, no matter where we are, who we are, what culture we come from, if I walk up to a total stranger in most parts of the world and I smile and stick my hand out and say hello, the chances are really good that they're going to smile and stick their hand out and say hello back to me. Uh, the chances are also just as good that if I walk up to a total stranger and kick them in the shins, uh, that they're probably going to, well, first wonder why on earth I did that, but then second, figure out if they can kick me back or if they could maybe, uh, you know, hurt me even more than I had hurt them. And so in, in the world of trust and mistrust, as you're talking through it, Otis, I keep thinking, you know, listeners here are probably in family businesses, and if they are, they have some level of conflict between at least two people inside the system. And one thing that's hopeful to think about is that if, if you can find a way to trust a person in in the system a little bit more today than you did yesterday, the chances are good that they're going to reciprocate that trust and that they're going to, sure, they'll be guarded if there's been hurt feelings and problems in the past, but that's really the only chance to try and reconstruct any trust that's been lost. Dana, that's, could you, a we have point. a question asking about some more examples of role modeling behavior. Could you talk about that with reciprocity and 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 some examples of how you've seen that work in some businesses with specific role modeling, what we want to have happen in those relationships? 
Yeah, sure. Um, there's a very vivid example in my head from a meeting that I was in two days ago. I was actually in the Middle East two weeks ago, or two days ago in Kuwait. And there was a con- there was an issue between a sister and a brother and another sister around the use of a family beach house. So one sister used uh, the beach house for her friends, and and the other sister was angry about it. And it's been this ongoing um, problem. You, you know, it, when you step back and look at it, it's a very small problem in a very large, financially successful um, family business system. So this sister and I uh, talked uh, before I left Kuwait um, with another member of the family, and she said, I just don't want my sister to get away with this. And my point to her was, if you're going to get beyond it, you've got to be the one to make the first move, right? Mm-hmm. I said, your real your real concern is that she's going to continue to use uh, or to make decisions that hurt your family relationships because you feel like you're being used. And she said, yeah, that's true. And I said, why don't you, in your talks with other members of the family, say, I'm, you know, I'm willing to overlook one portion of this as long as we're confronting the fact that there is an issue and that, that, and that it does cause tension and that, yes, we care about each other. Yes, we want to uh, be fair to each other, but we have to attack this problem in a, in a coping, caring kind of way, but it can't be passive. We have to change something. We have to talk about it. And she, uh, she was relieved by that idea that by taking just a little bit of a, a step back instead of attacking her sister, saying, you know what, if I, can, if I can say, okay, I'll overlook this only really with the assurance that we're going to focus on making sure that, that this problem doesn't keep happening over and over in the future. I hope that helps to understand that, that part of it. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, any attack requires either defense or withdrawal, and both of those destroy trust. On the other hand, if you can confront the issues in a productive way, find a way to cope, uh, then people can move forward. So I, I was with two brothers this week who actually uh, a few years ago uh, were in court suing each other over the business their father passed on to them. They've gotten through this. But their issue is how do we not pass that kind of behavior on to our children who are going to be the owners of this business after us? They recognize that uh, that was something passed on to them, that kind of uh, attack behavior, and uh, they want to back away from that and find a better way. And that comes down to open communication and dealing with issues rather than sweeping them under the rug because they're too volatile to talk about. Otis, if I can use another example uh, there about self-need orientation and multiple need Mm -hmm. orientation. In this same time that I was um, in Kuwait, the the same family has a group of third-generation members, and I did a workshop with them to talk with them about the work that their parents were doing around family governance. And a couple of times a question came up, and these are 16, 17, 18, 19-year-old you know, teenagers, and a couple of questions came up that were very self-centered, um, and you know, not surprisingly for those of us who have teenagers <laughs> but, or have lived with them, right? Um, and a couple of times I, 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 in response I said, well, think about what's going on. Your, 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 your parents are in the midst of a pretty big quandary, and they've got a lot of problems to solve. So if they don't solve their problems, you're not going to have things to worry about. I mean, you're not going to have the business. It can, it can fail, you know, and I said it a couple of times. And, and finally, when another question came a few hours later that was also a bit self-centered, another member of the family, another member of, young member of the family said, hey, I don't think you heard what, what he said earlier. If we don't support our parents in this, if we don't make sure that they can – get through their conflicts, we're not going to have any business to, you know, to worry about or benefit from. So they were, you know, he was modeling good behavior. He was able to help the others see away from self-need orientation and towards kind of thinking of all of us together and how getting conflict right and managing it right was good for everyone. 
and that is the key, being able to see that it's not a matter of my needs, but our needs, and, the, and realizing that what uh, families do in business together impacts everyone in the whole system. Uh, I think that takes us to the next slide, the sources of mistrust in family relationships, just being able to recognize those uh, as, they, as they occur, and they occur quite naturally. So one of those is the failure to accept who we are as adults versus who we were when we were children. You know, that's a part of family relationships. All of us experience these interesting feelings when we go back to visit the uh, elementary school where that we attended, or sometimes when we are, we're home for certain holidays, we begin to, to see ourselves in, in the, the situation that we were as children rather than how we are now as adults. And being able to extend forgiveness and move on from what may be perceived as wrongs of the past is really, in many ways, based on being able to accept each other as functioning adults rather than uh, reverting back to our childhood. There are also, I think, some inadequate or outdated assumptions we, we often make about ourselves stemming from these things. We have to realize that each of us has grown, we've learned things, we have families of our own often, there's the people that we are dealing with, with as adults uh, are much more complex than perhaps the uh, childhood relationships that we have. And those things all can lead to expectations that may be unrealistic or too simplistic. So we need to check our expectations and really uh, think about are they reasonable or would we like to be held to those expectations um, and begin to focus on uh, our commonalities rather than our differences. That, that I think can be one of the biggest causes of mistrust. As children, you know, we grow up really focusing on differences but uh, distinguishing ourselves. But the point here is to focus on what we have in common. Uh, that can be very powerful. And seeking individual goals over common good is uh, just what we're talking about in terms of self-need orientation versus multiple need orientation. We have to understood, understand that our common good really serves us all better than anyone's individual. And an assumed need to compete for the top job is often what inspires a lot of conflict in family businesses we work with, even when no one has actually expressed that uh, particular uh, com competition. Uh, I find often when I come to work with a client, everyone in the family system and many people in the business system are assuming that there's going to be conflict among family members over who will be the next. CEO or president, uh, rather than dealing openly with that, uh, there's just this unspoken unease that uh, assumes a lot of conflict. But I think trust uh, can, can do a lot to overcome all that. There are some important benefits of creating trust. Uh, first of all, it creates efficiency in the organization. Trust encourages savings and investment, and it reduces a lot of transaction costs. Uh, Paul Zach's studies at Claremont University show this. But, you know, just for example, uh, one of the efficiencies created by trust is that it takes a lot fewer lawyers to make it possible for us to work and own a business together if trust is there. And therefore, it's going to cost a lot less for those uh, important transaction event as we move uh, our business ownership along in a family. But trust also increases loyalty, not just among the family members who own the business, 
but among all the employees who work in that business. Employees in a high-trust organization are six times more likely to remain loyal than their peer group in this study the Hudson Institute did. But I think we all experience that. It, when there's high trust in an organization, which is that tone set by the owners and leaders of the organization, when that trust level is high, everyone feels more loyal because they feel the, the organization is loyal to them. And it enables positive change. Uh, trust in a society is strongly correlated with economic growth. Uh, that's always the, the case. When people have confidence, and confidence it can be defined as trust, uh, economic growth uh, comes from that. Uh, so having trust in our culture, in our family, and in our business makes it a much more productive. Otis, I've got to share an, an example. Of, sorry to interrupt you. Please um, do. It's, uh, I'm just reading Creates Efficiency about, you know, that trust encourages savings and investment reduces transactions costs. So, mm -hmm. again, we're, we're talking about managing conflict in family businesses. So conflicts can become intense. They're always going to happen. I mean, they're going to be predictable. I heard this story from a client where he went into uh, – have his car repaired, and and he said I, he said I'm mechanically disinclined. As he told me this, he said I I really literally know nothing about cars. I can't even open the hood, is what he said. Uh, but he said um, the the auto repair fellow said um, you know we'll take care of you. And he said you've got to be honest with me. He said he said honestly you could take advantage of me here, and I would have no idea what to do. So when he came back to get the car, the fellow said, what you said about trusting me was, was so impactful to me. He said, the price was actually going to be about $550. He said, that's what we started with. And he said, and I kept feeling like you were trusting so much that I kept finding ways to reduce costs so that what was going to cost him $550 only cost him 375 at the end of the day. And I thought that was such a great example of how Exhibiting trust and, and, and implying it and making it even explicit can really, truly reduce transaction costs. That, that's a great example. <laughs> I wish that worked with my auto repair place. Maybe it does. <laughs> uh, but conflict happens, right? Uh, we all know that. I mean, it's just simply a fact of life. So let's accept that conflict is natural in family. Let's don't try to deny it. Let's not try to fight it. Let's accept that it's there. Why is it there? It's, it's there, as I said earlier, because as children, we grow up working to differentiate ourselves from each other. We want to be recognized as an individual, not as just one of a group of siblings or a group of cousins. So that is part of the process. Not only that, our parents and other adults in the family system encourage us to be independent. And that's a good thing. These aren't bad things. It's good to be independent, to be self-sufficient, to be responsible for ourselves. However, if this independence becomes dysfunctional, it can be what uh, the late Senator Barry Goldwater uh, described when he was in his autobiography. He was talking about his fellow citizens in Arizona, and he described them as cussedly independent, when, when independence goes too far it, to result in unyielding, self-absorbed behaviors in working and owning relationships, then it takes us into conflict. And, and here are just some of the types of conflict that we see. There are role conflicts because Sometimes we aren't sure which role we're supposed to play. And often in family business relationships, people are reluctant to describe jobs, to provide titles, to really nail down these roles. So those need to be taken care of. Work relationship conflict. Is this your job or my job? Are we expected to compete? Are we being compared to each other? How do we... How do we define 
our roles within this organization so that we are not automatically placed into conflicting relationships. There are also potential shareholder conflicts. People in particularly third generation and beyond have very different needs. They have different family situations, different lifestyles, a lot of things that are different. And we need to understand that those present potential shareholder conflict. Now, it, it, that needs to be discussed and dealt with in terms of what's good for all shareholders together rather than each individual uh, fighting for their own share of this. Generational conflicts are also uh, going to be there. Uh, at, at generational transition points, particularly, the older generation frequently is more conservative. The younger generation is looking at the business and at the fact that there are more of them than there are in the previous owning generation and realizing the business needs to grow. So the younger generation may be much more um, accepting of risk and the older generation much more resistant to risk, and that can cause conflict. There's sibling conflicts that come from just the fact that we are brothers and sisters and grew up with each other and have a history there. Those are things we need to get over. Cousins conflicts because we didn't all grow up in the same household, and I'm not sure exactly what your parents taught you or uh, not sure about that school you went to or whatever that may be. Those, because we are more removed as cousins and gender conflict, uh, male and female owners, male and female executives working together, male and female family members have different perspectives. Now, the interesting thing is each one of these potential conflict relationships is also a potential asset to the business because if we can deal with all of these openly through good communication, each contributes a valuable perspective on the business and can actually help us to make better decisions. So let's look at some basic assumptions about conflict. Uh, conflict comes from competing opinions, thoughts, philosophies, beliefs. These things are realities for us. Now, we might look at them and say, oh, you know, that's just what so-and-so thinks that's that's some, something that uh, they've made up. It's not real. It is real if they feel it because emotions are what we act on. And so we must be prepared to deal with emotions as reality. That means that we, don't, we shouldn't necessarily take uh, action to, uh, to change something simply because someone feels that way, but it means that we should be willing to put these things on the table and discuss them intelligently, not just dismiss someone's opinion or someone's fear because they don't have the same level of sophistication about the business that we do. We need to make sure all of those are, are open for discussion and discussed completely. Conflict is inevitable. It's a natural byproduct of any relationship, but particularly family relationships. But it's not good or bad. It is a fact of life. And conflict, when used constructively, forces us to rethink and to examine carefully our assumptions our automatic behavior. And this is particularly important for family members who are running a company to stop and listen to the concerns of those family members who are not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the business. To say, is there something we've overlooked here? Let us respond to your concerns as completely as we can to make sure you understand, but also make sure we understand your point of view, because in doing that, we take a deeper look, and we are not as susceptible to operating on invalid assumptions. 
we examine those more carefully. So there are better and there are worse ways of managing conflict is really the conclusion here. And Dana is going to take us through some of the stages of conflict that we have to deal with. Thanks, Otis. Uh, we're about halfway through. just want to encourage everyone to make sure you're taking notes. And if you can get one, two, or three points out of our time here that help you get through a difficult conversation or conflict with a family member or significant other, then uh, it's worthwhile. We're hope hoping that this is helpful to you. I want to um, use a model that was put forth by a fellow named Daniel Turberger um, in Switzerland, and he talked about four stages of conflict. Um, I'm going to tell you a story as I go through this model that was told to me after I had presented this model at a workshop, and it's uh, a story told to me by a fellow named John, and John and his brother and sister and mom and dad had a, a, a manufacturing company in Jamaica, and John told me that uh, as I told this story, or as I talked through this four stages of conflict model, that he could see a certain amount of time and pain and conflict kind of passing before his eyes. And so I'll tell you, it, as he told me, he said, uh, my father passed away and left us uh, this manufacturing company, um, chicken rotisserie company, actually. They built the rotisserie machines. And he said, it's my brother and I and my sister and our mother who inherited the business from our father. And after we had mourned his death uh, and started talking about what we were going to do going forward, two divergent ideas came up about the future. He said, one of us, and he took, he took uh, responsibility for it. He said, I wanted to grow the company. And he said, my brother Mark did not. We talked about, you know, pros and cons of both. I wanted to grow. We had a great brand. We had good people. We had access to capital. We were young, energetic. We wanted to grow. But Mark, his brother, said, you know what? We have a comfortable life. Our company makes plenty of money. Uh, we live in a beautiful part of the world. Let's spend time with our families. And he said, looking back on it, I realize now that we went from a state of peace to a, a world of tension. And once we get into a world of tension, We've got some choices to make in our relationships. We can communicate openly. We can try and understand each other. We can seek to solve the problem rather than to attack the person. And we can, again, as Otis said, make choices that help build trust inside of these complicated systems. But John, again, he took responsibility for this, and he said, but I didn't do that, and neither did my brother. And he said, what did we do? We mobilized our allies. He said, my brother went to my mother, went to our mother, and said, Mom, uh, you know, John wants to go and leverage the company and take on all this debt, and, and what do you think about that? And, of course, Mom, who had just lost her husband and was, was elderly, she, didn't, she wasn't comfortable with risk, uh, generationally very predictable. And John said he went to his sister while Mark had gone to their mother. He went to his sister, who didn't need the money from the business, was pretty well off uh, in, in her husband's occupation and in their family scenario, she said, yeah, let's take on some debt. Let's build this business. Let's go. So now we're into a, a world of mobilizing allies around a different, different ideas. And again, John took credit here and said, looking back on it, I know why I took it to the next stage. He said, my brother had always been more popular than me. He'd been smarter than me. He was more handsome than me. And he said, and, and it's painful to admit but I wanted to be the winner of this battle. And this is a really important point that I would like all of us to think about. In any relationship that we've got, we get to this point, we've gotten to this point, I'm sure of it, where we can, we can pull back from a conflict, stop trying to be right, and start focusing on what's the right decision, what's the best idea, what's the cooperation? What's the collaboration? What's the compromise? But John said, I didn't do that. And he said, I started to say things like, we're going to, it's my way or the highway. We're going down this path no matter what. And it led to, as Turberger said, a world of trench warfare where you can see both sides now are, are mobilized. There's allies, there's delineations, there's you know people building trenches, stringing up barbed wire, putting on helmets, pointing their rifles. Uh, and saying, I'm not moving from this position. Now, how do you get away from the, the, the stage between mobilizing allies and trench warfare? Mediation, right? Getting other people who are considered neutral 
by both parties to say, let's talk through this. You know, what are other alternatives to get beyond this conflict? How can we focus on finding the best idea? But instead, as John said, um, we went into a, a world of kamikaze warfare where he said, literally, he said, I, I started to wake up at 2 a.m. every morning thinking, I hope, I hope we go down in flames, or if he goes down in flames, I'm going down too. And as long as, you know, he gets hurt, I don't care how much it hurts me. And they bankrupted the company. They had lawsuit after lawsuit, and it had a very bad ending. And the worst part of it um, that I remember so vividly was John um, becoming emotional as he said, what really hurts, Dana, out of this whole story is that I haven't spoken to my brother in five years. He said, I don't know my nieces. I don't know my nephews. And he said, before my dad passed away, he said, my brother and I were so close. So looking back on it, he could see these stages work themselves through. Please take a minute uh, today or tomorrow as soon as you can and think about any relationship inside your family business system that you've got that is up close to number two and maybe moving into number three where you're going towards trench warfare and get some help. Get somebody to help you think through it. Focus on choosing the best idea rather than wanting to win because there's a lot at stake here, as we all know. Approaches to managing it. So back to this idea of destructive versus constructive management of conflict. If we avoid conflict, we're not helping, right? If we withdraw from a confrontation that's, that's productive confrontation, we're not helping. If we enable people around us uh, with conflict and with uh, bad behaviors, we're moving towards higher stages of conflict that have higher stakes and that are harder to come back from. You know, getting even and escalating a conflict. Wow, boy, if we could bottle up all the energy in the world that is spent on you know, trying to be right and trying to win an argument with a sibling or with someone close to us, you know, we could power the world for a long, long time, I'm sure. You know, better for us all, and of course the only people that can make this decision is each of us individually, is to start thinking about how to, how to manage conflict in a much more constructive way. Um, you know, preventing conflict if it's predictable and if it's destructive is to try and find ways around it. Um, you know, we forget that, that things that aggravate us about the people that we know the best are very predictable things. And it's really up to us to say, well, if, if so-and-so has acted in this way in the past, the chances are good they're going to act this way in the future. Therefore, I should take responsibility for finding ways not to allow that behavior and that other person's decisions to affect me in a negative way. Um, you know, reducing interactions and structuring interactions and, and personal counseling, right? Taking a, a, not a controlling in a negative way, but kind of controlling the environment in a way that moves us towards positive outcomes is a great constructive way to deal with conflict. And negotiating, right? Compromising. Uh, that example I told you about the family in Kuwait where the sister was able to say, okay, I can, I can overlook this particular offense that's happened and that I've taken, but I, but I really need us to focus on assuming it's going to happen again in the future and figuring out how not to make it negative and to avoid it. Accommodating, collaborating, and just really right, right at the end is just that, that point about confronting root causes. If conflicts come up over and over again, Makes sense to really clear some time and say, why is this happening, right? What's going on? And in some cases, if two people have um, uh, a lot of tension in a relationship, sometimes it is best to just kind of keep, keep away from each other for a while and to make sure that um, there's a path to get around it. You know, a big part of what Otis and I see in our work and our colleagues see is that there's also a setting about culture and conflict in the families that we work with. Um, some styles of communication in families are what, what we would call kind of the shallow river, always flowing, always trickling along, but we never dive deep, right? It's always pleasant. We're always talking about things that are not um, necessarily confrontational or divisive, uh, but it's pleasant. And you know what? That sometimes works really well for some families, talking about 
kids and sports and, you know, um, avoiding things like politics and religion <laughs> and, and just talking about the, kind of the niceties of life. Sometimes that works for people. There are other families who don't speak unless they're talking about very deep subjects, deep philosophical things. And you know what? Neither is right nor wrong, it, but it's important to know the styles, especially, by the way, when someone in your family gets married. Because when you bring another person into a family, you're importing a new style and a new setting of culture and communication and conflict. Okay? And it's important. And that's to really give... important. If I could just interrupt a moment, Please. Dana, to say how critical that is, because when that new person comes in, they're watching everyone else to determine the culture of this family. They're, they're trying to figure out where and how they fit in. Great point, great point, and so important to, to to give them the chance to be themselves and to make sure that they, they feel welcome. One of the very best things I've ever heard said in any workshop ever was by a mother who said, you know, the, the question of conflict was around in-laws, and, and her she said she had four sons, and they had each been married, um, and they were each married, and, and somebody asked her, well, do you get along with all of your daughters-in-law? And she said, not at the same level, but she said, I made a point. She said, I had a pretty sticky relationship with my mother-in-law in my life, and I didn't want that to continue for my kids. So she said, I made a point that when my new daughter-in-law uh, was introduced to the family, I took her aside and I said to her, you're the very best thing that ever happened to my son. Thank you. She said, I wasn't saying whether I liked her tremendously or didn't like her tremendously. She said, all I was saying was, we're so glad that you have added so much to our son's life, and you're welcome here. And I think that's brilliant. Um, dealing with conflict. So we all know enough about families to know that there's kind of extreme ways of dealing with it. The volcano, as an individual, is someone who can take a lot of pressure and a lot of pressure and lets the pressure build and doesn't show a crack until there's an eruption. And, and the eruption is painful, uh, it spews ashes and lava and heat and fire all around. I guess it probably makes that volcano person feel better, right? But it doesn't have a great kind of long-term outcome. Uh, then there's the dynamite with a short fuse. So I've run across families where any small problem gets blown out of proportion very quickly. Sharp words are spoken, um, and, and it happens quickly. But then there's often... Also, just as quickly, hugs and kisses, and I'm so sorry that I said that, and please forgive me, and you know, and things go along merrily from there until the next dynamite explosion. You know, why to bring this up? If you want something to talk about with your family at a deeper level in a family meeting, around dinner, uh, or in a in a more organized way, ask each other: Are we volcanoes? Or are we dynamite sticks with short fuses? And if so, how can we make a little bit of improvement in those areas? Families also have different norms and expectations. You know, some just want harmony and peace, right? Just, uh, you know, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Let's all just get along. Others want competition, and they want achievement, and they want that tension that comes from it. Again, neither wrong nor right, but it's important for you to understand yourself, uh, your spouse or significant other, your siblings, and your family culture so that you know kind of from where you're starting. Best Dana, practice. We have, yeah. So so as you're going into best practices, we have a question that goes along with this, and it also goes back to, to our rotisserie family question. About okay. How do you manage conflict when, when you have a couple of people in the business who both have the same goal to grow the company but different views on how to get there, and both people really feel that their way is the right way and there's no middle ground because they have very opposite directions in mind? Great question. Great question, and one that comes up often. Uh, in that case, I would say with, with very kind of little thinking about it because it happens so often is get objective outside advice. Find a person or a group of people, whether that's an advisory board, whether it's uh, a 20 group in the auto dealership world or uh, a group of associations, people who are also in your similar business, and, and let them bring objective thought to it, right? If you trust them, both, if both people who have competing ideas or competing strategies um, trust the outside advisor 
you're going to get a long way towards, again, solving the problem, not being right or wrong or winning an argument, but solving the problem in the way that is most likely to be good for everyone, right? That's a great question. Thank you, Jennifer, for interjecting with that. Right. And one more, while we're still kind of on, on yours and, and Otis's points about, about in-laws, how do you deal with in-laws if they're very different from the rest of the family and, and some of the conflicts that they bring in? <laughs> now, this sounds like another webinar altogether. Uh, great question. I mean, the in-law question is one that causes a lot of stress. Uh, here's what I would say about in-laws. Let's be real honest. I mean, the, the biggest concern about in-laws is that a relationship will end in divorce and that it will cause um, financial and emotional stress. Okay? That's about as directly as I can say it. No matter what anyone does, that's going to be possible. It okay? doesn't matter how much time, how wise your counsel is, or how many books you've read, or how great you are at every other part of your life. Two people are different, and, they, and their relationship could end. Okay? Uh, it, it is possible. All that we're talking about here is giving, using best practices to create the highest probability that people will get along. In-laws are just like everybody else, right? I'm an in-law, just like my wife's an in-law. What, in what do people want, human beings want? They want to feel important. They want to feel included. They want to feel as if someone has listened to them. The opposite of that is they don't want to feel excluded. None of us do. So including in-laws appropriately in a family business system, to me, is the key. Appropriately is kind of the magic word, right? Um, does that mean that an in-law who doesn't have shares in the business and doesn't have a role in the business should be making decisions at the board level? No, obviously not. But an in-law who doesn't have shares and isn't a member of the company or an employee might have something to say about the family reunion or the family vacation or a list of common values that um, a group of siblings or cousins are trying to teach to their kids. So asking their opinion, listening to them, and integrating their thoughts appropriately can go a very, very long way to lowering the tensions around the in-law relationship. And here's another thing that happens. You know, my grandmother and my family, I never thought of her as an in-law. Somebody probably did before I came along. So there's this magical thing that happens, that in-laws, as time goes by, aren't in-laws anymore. They're just a part of the family where that, that kind of risk stage has, has passed. So be careful. Include them appropriately. Give them information and, and ask their opinion and listen to them. That's the key here in, in best practices. If there was only one word on this slide and every slide from here on out, it would be listen. The best leaders that we deal with in our consulting practice listen extremely well. They listen actively. Uh, they reiterate what people are saying, and they think carefully about other people's perspective. Talk about the problems, not the people. Do not label people with a problem. Again, what you're trying to do is solve a very complicated group of problems, uh, and you have to do it together. You know, five heads are better than one, right? Uh, that's what Google has proved. You can link together a lot of powerful CPUs and brain power. You're, you're going to solve a lot more problems that way. So you can highlight common interests. Um, avoid accusatory language. So you, from now on, every time anyone in the family uh, says, you never or you always or you make me so mad, smile and, and raise your hand and say, that's not really possible. Remember we learned that on the webinar, Zions? <laughs> the bank, the bank uh, webinar. These things are not possible. Um, nobody ever does anything always, right? Uh, and and I, can only be, I can only make myself mad. So avoid that kind of language. And take responsibility for your own role in the conflict, right? It takes two to tango. And then understand human nature and conflict. Okay, we, we all are human beings, and we've all got buttons that can be pushed. And, you know, a button that could be pushed today is not going to get pushed tomorrow. It depends on a mood and a circumstance and a, and a feeling of well-being. And the best possible way uh, to deal with it is to communicate, 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 which means to talk honestly and to listen actively and to focus on solving problems together. And focus on values. Uh, one of the things that, that I do at the end of every one of my uh, 
family governance sessions or family meetings is to literally force clients to say, okay, we've talked about problems, we've solved problems, we've identified problems, we've, we've come up with options for solving problems. So it feels a bit negative. Let's end by saying what we're grateful for. Um, gratitude has actually been shown to change the physiology of the human brain uh, when it's expressed consistently. So why are we so fortunate to have the blessing of this family business? What have other people done and sacrificed before us? Uh, before us? And if those people are in the room, please take a minute and say thank you for your sacrifice and thank you for what you've done for me. What kinds of stories and things and examples uh, that we grew up with that, that are out there that define our family. I can think in my own family business system, um, stories of my grandfather and the sacrifices that he made long ago that caused him physical and emotional pain that I benefit from today. And I try and talk with that with a lot of people about that because it, it, it changed my life. Uh, what do we believe together, right? Rather than talk about the differences uh, in, in our opinions, what do we believe together? Because there's a lot of strength in that. And how do our family values impact our business? Family, family values, by the way, best described or defined as things that we want to teach to our children and grandchildren, principles that we want, that we think will be important in 100 years, things that we're even willing to lose money adhering to, ideas about you know, integrity and work and respect and kindness and charity and all the good things in life. We have a lot of things in common. One of the most impactful things I read in a book uh, was, was in a book called Difficult Conversations by uh, Sheila Heen and Doug Stone, and there was one other writer, and I can't remember his name. I apologize. But it, it was a very different way of thinking about conflict, and their point was anytime someone becomes defensive, there's a really good chance that that person is becoming defensive in a relationship because they're not happy with themselves. And specifically, they're not happy with the, the answer that they're getting for themselves to one of these three questions. Am I a good person? Am I worthy of love? And am I competent? And, and to me, this is really significant. And I catch myself often in arguments and in uh, conflicts with other people where I realize if I'm acting defensively, if I'm lashing out, if I'm unhappy, a lot of times... It's really, truly because I'm not happy with the answer to that question in myself. And being aware of that can help us as we craft compromises and solutions to problems. You know, we can think, what is it that, that this person or, or me, right, what am I not answering yes to out of these three questions? And what can we do to increase the likelihood that the answer to these three questions is yes? because that's going to make the conflict easier to deal with and a solution easier to discover together. Uh, we've talked a little bit about listening. I want to make the emphasis again. You know, listening is much more than just waiting for your turn to speak. It's an active, active word, a verb. It is, you know, truly trying to understand someone's perspective. It doesn't mean agreeing with them. It means trying to understand where they're coming from and why they might have experienced a set of circumstances in the way that they have. Um, communication uh, starts with listening. Um, communication that's effective is frequent and consistent. Okay? So often in family governance, we, we create a meeting point or a forum where we can talk about things that we're worried about or that are problems that we're having. And if something happens that scares us or that is unsettling, it's too easy to not schedule the next meeting. We have to keep going and trying to get better at managing. Clarity, being clear, being direct, right? Being open and honest, and also the timing, right? Uh, boy, when we bring things up is so important. Um, you know, talking about a family issue after dinner and drinks, for instance, is probably not a great idea when, when people are tired and maybe uh, a little bit under the effects of, of other substances is, is not great timing. But when people have clear thought and are able to kind of focus on solving problems, that's better. And, and part of that is just planning the event. If we have a meeting, uh, you know, every first Monday of the quarter where we focus for two hours on family issues rather than business issues, you know, that's a great start up to a whole day on it. 
Uh, I'm going to have to in, you know, increase my my speed here a little bit because I can see we're we're a bit behind. Happy, okay. by the and, way, to and talk. And Dana, we have one question to kind of add into this as, you, as we're we're hurrying through our last few slides. But what okay. if you if you have family members who are, have already reached the point where they're they're geographically distant, they're not communicating with each other or speaking at all? What can they do to what sort of an event or what can they do to to kick that off and and start that communication again? Well, I mean, it's some sort of event where the question is, how much do we want to communicate and in what manner going forward, right? I mean, part of this is just understanding what people want and figuring out a way to give people, most people most of what they want. If some people don't want to be involved in a family business, either as owners or as employees, one of the absolute worst things we can do is try and force them into that. So if people are introverted, for instance, and don't like a lot of communication events and feel very uncomfortable, uh, about it. They might want to input uh, their thoughts into a family process um, in writing, in an email, uh, in a letter. So first of all, is scheduling an event and saying, look, let's be honest, we haven't met as often as some of us would have liked. We haven't had this communication. What are we going to do differently going forward? How much in inclusion do you want? How much do you want to be involved? And, you know, unless they're completely off base and, and are being unreasonable, which is also uh, you know, uh, a danger, then usually you can compromise around some set of parameters that works for most people. Um, thank you again for the question. And set up rules of engagement, right? How are we going to talk to each other? Uh, I just went through this again a couple of days ago with a client. Uh, don't interrupt each other. You know, I'd like people to raise their hand. Please be on time. You know, if if we together say, how are we going to make sure communication is working well? We've got a much better chance of improving communication. You know, great wisdom seeking first to understand and then to be understood from Stephen Covey. Now watch out for and avoid satellite communication. Often mom in a family business system is the satellite where communication gets beamed up and then beamed down and then beamed up and then beamed down. And there's always the risk that something's going to go wrong in the translation of it. So more direct, the better. And then take an attitude of continuous improvement. You know what? If you take three steps forward and two steps back, that's still positive. And being open to saying, wow, we really blew it when we had this blow up or, or apologizing and saying, what are we going to do better going forward is such a key. But yeah, and wouldn't it be terrific if, if all of this were really all that simple, that what the consultants say uh, just magically happened? <laughs> it's not. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a very difficult set of emotions inside of a family business system. Very magical. I mean, honestly, if we think about great happiness that comes in life, much of it is with the people that we care about when there's you know, financial benefits and success all around us, but it can also be tough. You know, one idea that a client shared with me about communication, uh, he and his wife were having some trouble, and uh, he, he, they were given by their marriage counselor a little teddy bear. And the teddy bear, he said, the counselor said, this is your relationship. And he said, it's a third entity. You've got, you know, one person, you've got John, and then you've got Rebecca, and, and you've got a third person. And the third person is your relationship. And you've got to protect the relationship. And so a lot of that can be tied back to, you know, this idea of a story. I have my perspective. Uh, if I'm in conflict with someone, he or she might have their own story. Well, let's try and listen and communicate well enough to say, Here's a third story. Jennifer, how are we doing on time? Do I need to stop abruptly, or can we go a little bit longer? I think we can go a couple more minutes if you want to. Okay. How do you get to that third story? Don't argue about who's right. You know, understand where the story's coming from. Share the impact on you. This is just communication one-on-one. -on -one. You know, this, when, when, when this happened, the impact on me was this. No one can argue with me or you about that. You have to own that. Move away from either you're right or I'm right to, you know what, we can both have elements of being right and we can make a decision about the future that's going to help us both or all of us. Don't blame. You know, take responsibility for your own contribution. And then just describe your feelings. Again, this is how it impacts me. This is, you know, I felt hurt. I felt happy. I felt sad. You know, those are all things that are responsible. And you've heard me say this enough. Um, already, but listening is absolutely the most powerful and underrated component of this whole process. Really listening transforms communication, and it's reciprocated, and it means being authentic. You know, don't, don't give out canned statements. 
I know all of us have heard statements by politicians, by newscasters, by uh, sports authorities, by people around us where we just know that somebody wrote it down and it's not authentic and we're not, we're just not that dumb. You know, we know when something is authentic and when it's not. Uh, I'm going to let you read through the rest of these since I'm out of time. Uh, but thinking first, I'll just pay attention to that last point, thinking first and then responding. Again, I love this this picture from one of my colleagues because we're in a world where siblings grow up together and say, shut up, no, you shut up, right? That's kind of communication, sibling communication 101 um, gone bad. There's never a dull moment um, in these systems. They're exciting. They're fun but they can also be heart-wrenching uh, inside of our businesses uh, and inside of our families. And the more that we can pay attention to the elements of a conflict, a specific conflict that we might have, uh, the better off we are. Because again, back to this starting slide, the goal is successful relationships. They create more happiness for us than ever. And those family relationships, be they um, blood or marriage, uh, are, are so important. And, and they form this foundation of superb organizations, whether they're family businesses or not family businesses. Um, good relationships can, can make the world a much better place for all of us. And they require all these things, uh, communication, forgiveness, hard work, and, and they can be too quickly destroyed, and they are absolutely based in trust. I hope that as you've spent some time with us today that there have been at least – one or two points that you feel like you can take and, and put some action into your next uh, communication with your family uh, members or uh, fellow workers around this point of, of communication and conflict. So good luck in managing your conflicts. I know we all need it. And uh, have a great rest of your day. To, to respond to one of our most popular questions today about the ability to listen to this again and to share it with other family members, this rebroadcast should be available for several months using the same link that you used for today's webcast. So please feel free to log in again, download the presentation, and, and ask questions. Thank you for your time, and we hope you will join us for our next presentation. Thank you, Gibson, for joining us today. This has been Wednesday's webcast.